Hi everybody, Lawrence Linker here from XC Academy. I've gathered great friends here today to talk about crypto. For someone who dares to come into the market today, they're probably, I find a lot more authentically curious about what's crypto, you know, um, they know it perhaps might one day, you know, make them a bit richer than today. So once you're on the platform and your account is funded, that's when the fun begins. That's when you can actually start to, you know, uh, uh, make use of all the products and services that are available. We pop like the Crisco, got rich off the crypto, I'm winning the game, you can like it or not. Hi everybody, Lawrence Linker here from XC Academy. When I first started learning about crypto three years ago, I read articles and books, I listened to podcasts and watched videos online. But what I found was most helpful for me was getting together with people working in the industry to hear about their stories and opinions of, from their day to day lives. So I wanted to bring that experience to you with this podcast series, Know Your Crypto, by getting together small groups of people working in the crypto scene here in Singapore at the places where we have these conversations. Today, I'm with Hassan and Sharon, and we are meeting at the beautiful Bisteca Steakhouse. If you haven't been, it's absolutely uh, incredible. In my opinion, the best steakhouse uh, in Singapore. And uh, I think they're rated as like officially the best steakhouse in Singapore and one of the 50 best in the world or something like that. Uh, definitely check it out if you haven't been. And of course, a shout out to James Chie for letting us use uh, the space. Hassan, please introduce yourself. Hey, Lawrence. Thanks for having me. Uh, excited to be here. My name is Hassan Ahmed. I'm the country director uh, for Singapore at Coinbase. Um, my crypto journey spans back from 2013 uh, when I first heard about crypto and kind of fell down the proverbial rabbit hole. Uh, it took me a few years, but then I eventually did get enough conviction to join the industry full time. So some of my experiences have been that I helped uh, eToro launch their crypto brokers in the U.S. Uh, I moved to Singapore in the region in 2019 uh, and was fortunate to also serve as CEO for Coins PH out of the Philippines uh, before joining Coinbase about two years ago. Very cool. Very cool. Sharon, hey. please. Right. Uh, hi, Hassan. Yeah, thanks for inviting us. So I kind of discovered Bitcoin first in 2012. Back then, I was still a college kid, I guess. Yeah, so there was a Bragging. bright... <laughs> yeah. Not, unfortunately, it's more than... Uh, okay, yeah, I, I probably too. won't I reveal my college. age on screen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, guys. Yeah, so I come from uh, Singapore Management University. So shout out to that school. Um, there was a really bright orange... ATM machine basically it was a physical place to buy Bitcoin. Yeah, so because you're so bright, uh, I was curious about it. That's how I knew about it. Um, but I'll say I really got into crypto in but only when Ethereum came out because back then, you know, I was running a development uh, house, so building software for clients. Uh, friends were all actual software developers, and that's where Ethereum came out, and that's to me, that's where I finally got the beauty of crypto. Yeah, so I would say professionally, however, I worked at a company now called As Fast. Back then, it was called Exfus, most commonly known in Singapore. Um, you know, kudos to the founders. They wanted to introduce local currencies into the crypto world. And to me, I think that was really more of a crazy wild experiment to be on in crypto. Uh, so I joined them to essentially lead the charge on what does it take to help mostly centralized exchange exchanges back then accept local currencies in Singapore. Um, that then evolved into a stable coin in those currencies as well. Yeah. Now, you know, what I do is uh, I started a company called Headquarters um, and we primarily Primarily focus on various tools to help crypto companies get their back office in order. Uh, and right now, we are the specific tool that we're focusing on is around financial reporting. Yeah, so that's what we do. Yeah, very cool. So uh, I wanted to ask both of you guys. Um, you know, we're in a place uh, in crypto now, so we're at the end of July, mm -hmm. 2023. It feels like we've been in winter for a long time, um, but maybe starting to see signs of spring. That's my perspective anyway. Hassan, how do, you, how do you view it? I think we have to zoom out a little bit and think about like crypto cycles and you know how uh, what maybe past cycles can instruct us about where we are today. Um, this is my, th I think, fourth, third crypto cycle uh, that we're going through right now. And uh, you know, there's, there's been a, one more, I think, before that. I think generally the trend has always been um, the, the, the hype and maybe just the financial side of crypto kind of gets ahead of itself. Um, mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of FOMO, people really kind of you know, come in maybe uh, primarily for speculation in the beginning stages, and that um, sort of collapses onto itself. And then there's more of a quiet period of building 
uh, where actually the, the underlying technologies get improving and the products on top of are improving. And I think that's what we're seeing this time around as well. I think those patterns are very, very close to what we've seen in 20 and 2019, uh, post 2017, and then even in some ways to 2014 after the 2013 hype as well. Um, I think markets wise, I'd say we're just in a chalk period at the moment. Mm. Uh, we're kind of going, you know, up and down. Um, and that's okay. That's, you know, to be expected. I think it's linked to some macro factors as well. But I think what's more fun to maybe observe is, is actually what's happening within the industry itself. Mm. Uh, what are, you know, builders actually doing? What are founders focusing on? Uh, what are the problem spaces that, that are being attacked? Uh, and I would maybe break it down in like three different categories. And these are, I think, the big challenges that like crypto has to kind of, you know, get through as an industry to get to the next cycle um, is, uh, you, you know, scalability at the infrastructure level, uh, usability at the application and access level, uh, and then just a broad overarching theme around policy. So um, those are things that you know happy to get more into, but I think that's sort of really what a lot of these focus areas for me are about. Yeah, scalability, mm. usability, <laughs> and policy. Makes, makes sense. Mm. Sharon, what's your view? Yeah. Um so I do find that, uh, okay, I can't really predict exactly when we'll get out of this uh, winter, but I do sense that, yeah, like you, you know, things are warming up a bit. And I have noticed personally as well with every cycle or what kind of gets us out of it is where there's really quite a big shift happening or big change in the market. So I think the first, you know, crash and return was kind of, or say the first euphoria came about where it was just pure Bitcoin. And then after that, the next euphoria that came out was Ethereum first and then that whole crazy wave of like utility tokens that came up after. But, you know, euphorias kind of die off and then the crash happens. DeFi summer came, NFT came. So I do think that we need another huge change in the market that's probably coming up for the next time and for me personally I think I, the biggest change that's very obvious right now is policy. Yeah, so rather than I think regulators in the world being maybe freaked out and taking a sudden pause. I don't. Know, I think that was their reactions over the past few years. Now you definitely don't see pauses, but you actually see progress. You actually mm. see a lot of clarity, um, detailed papers coming out. Um, in terms of whether this is an actual proposed, you know, uh, guideline or maybe this is a inclination or where I'm heading towards. You know, maybe yeah. So I'm actually very pleased with that. And to me, that is, it falls under the bucket of kind of a big shift forward mm. yeah so because i see that happening in many countries now in the recent months especially this year i do sense that things are warming, warming up because of that yeah very cool yeah. That maybe uh as a extension of that question how will we know when the winter is over what is the sign that we look for is it is it asset prices is it uh you know investment levels and in, in, you know in in terms of like mm. startups and projects is it user growth what's the primary metric that you think maybe the market in general is looking at and then what do you care about personally yeah that's a great question i think that there's you know a few different dimensions to to measure uh, because again you know crypto is multifaceted it's an underlying technology and to me honestly the 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 easy heuristic for me is money crypto and tech crypto and i do think that uh, while they're interrelated it's worth tracking them separately so on the money crypto side it it really is i think the, the basic you know kpi is just market cap of kind of the entire space uh, that generally, you know, reflects asset prices and, and sort of um, somewhat of an indicator of new money coming into the space as well, uh, which is an indicator of new, at least investors and, and users coming into the space. Um, I think on the uh, the tech side of things, um, you know, we do track uh, things like weekly or monthly active developers. Um, Ethereum right now is the largest ecosystem, uh, followed by a few others, but that is a leading indicator mostly of Okay, there's um, you know build activity that's happening uh, that is then you know going to uh, result in uh, more use cases and and just uh, better experiences for end users. Uh, VC funds kind of go across both. Uh, if there is VC uh, uh, funds coming into early stage projects to to kind of add fuel to that fire, um, that obviously is, is healthy. So so I think across those, uh, like I said, I think we're in the somewhat of a chop period on like just the public market side of it. Uh, I think VC funding, if um, there's actually a report, I think last week, which talked about like the last month was maybe one of the lowest yeah, points like uh, that we've seen. Yeah, percent down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Uh, but I do think that like it's pretty much a bottom, you know, on that metric. Uh, the nice thing is that actually uh, monthly active developers have stayed pretty resilient uh, yeah. through the whole cycle. And I think that goes to what Sharon, you were saying earlier about 
I think with this cycle, we've pretty much sort of de-risked, you know, the, the question of, hey, is crypto going to be around? Now it's more a question of, hey, how big is this going to be uh, and in what velocity? Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. which is always interesting, right? Because with a lot of these uh, assets, you kind of go, well, it either go, goes to zero or it gets really big, right? And so the 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 fear, I think, for a lot of people tends to be, oh, my God, is it going to zero, <laughs> right? And then once that fear is over, then the uh, optimism of it of it getting big maybe uh, tends to come in. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so fine. This is where we're at in the cycle. Things are starting to feel a little bit more optimistic. Obviously, in terms of um, uh, overall market cap of the industry, it's still quite you know quite low um, compared to what it's been in the past. How does this affect mm. you where you're at in your business mm. today, Sharon? Yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, um, crypto aside, even being very early stage founders, there's, you can probably relate to this. You know, there's like, usual yeah. ups and downs. Yeah. So putting that situation aside, um, I'll say it is very apparent that the market has shrank. Uh, so you know, as a tool in the business, it is B2B entirely. Um, and I think what we're seeing in the market is that... Um, Definitely a lot of enterprises, I think, are still there. Funds, you know, who are interested in the space, they are still there. What has unfortunately happened, I think, is that small to medium-sized uh, merchants, if you call them, uh, in crypto, those have shrank a lot. Yeah, so for tools, they are targeting the SMB market. I think it's tough right now for them. Um, and when I say SMB, you know, it's not just about a... Uh, SMB e-commerce, you know, trying to accept crypto. I don't really relate to that. It's more of um, if you're a small to medium-sized crypto native projects. Um, the number of them around, it's they're kind of still themselves in that survival phase because most maybe, you know, some may not have raised, you know, but earn some, you know, in the previous cycle, whether through NFT sales or DeFi revenue, um, questionable how long they can last perhaps. Uh, those that raise, you know, most of the time they raise on the lower spectrum of like single digit millions. Uh, so, I think the risk here that we all see, uh, it's it's everyone is still in a state of, you know, can I survive beyond one year or two years, to put it bluntly. So if you're a service provider attacking that target market, it is realistically a scary space to be in. Um, so the only way that you can overcome that is you got to watch over yourself as well. Mm. As much as you want to grow aggressively as much as possible, but... You know, I think the key here is to, su- to survive. Um, you know, hopefully for the next two, three years, you know, just keep the eye on the price to like survive. Um, so yeah, that's my personal take on that. Yeah, yeah. fair enough. Now, obviously, Coinbase, you guys are in a different position. You're not a startup anymore. I don't know if you still think of yourselves as a, as a startup. You're a publicly <laughs> traded company, good sized business, but you're not um, immune to market cycles. What are you guys thinking about in terms of this environment and, and mm-hmm. what's coming, what's next for you? Yeah, I think for this cycle, uh, there's a lot of macro overhang that affected the entire tech industry um, at large. Um, so I think Coinbase was, you know, part of kind of getting swept up in that. Now, uh, having sort of reached to a point of, you know, being a publicly listed company does allow us to uh, achieve a certain level of capitalization and be able to tap into public markets. Mm -hmm. So, for example, along with our direct listing, we had also done a kind of a private bond issuance, uh, which which was, um, I think, very good timing uh, at the time. But but I think uh, beyond sort of just the the capitalization side of it, the one thing that's been important for us, um, you know, going through the last year, year and a half is to. Um, sort of to get lean again and to get fit uh, in order to be able to ship fast. I think um, while we were preparing for a lot of growth, uh, then the, as the market turned, we then adapted our plans accordingly. Um, so we, we were fortunate to have just, you know, fantastic talent at like all levels of the organization. Uh, and so, you know, our finance teams and, and the business planning teams and product teams, we've uh, done a, 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 it's a stellar job at just really kind of refactoring down the company mm-hmm. um, so that, you know, we're able to, to, everyone's able to be what I would think about it as like as an individual contributor plus mm. so that, that the whole like, if you remember more, you know, even like Zuckerberg and others were talking about like, you know, no manager of managers anymore. Mm. Um, so that's a little bit of, um, you know, how we've thought about, uh, mm. you know, getting lean and, and, and mean again. Very nice. Okay. And I guess, um, you know, we, we originally had a third chair uh, for for the uh, chat today who unfortunately uh, had COVID, <laughs> turned up COVID positive this morning. So, um, but, but as you guys know, what I wanted to chat about in particular yeah. was um, the experience of new customers coming on board 
uh, to interact and engage with crypto for the first time. And, uh, and I think, Sharon, actually, you have some, some good okay. perspective mm-hmm. on this as well, because uh, the first time that I ever mm-hmm. brought, bought crypto was in Singapore. Mm-hmm. It was using Singapore dollars. Okay, nice. And so I had right. to use <laughs> great. Xfers. Okay, that's great. <laughs> so I my, found this my, be very my happy. <laughs> <Yeah>. Nice, okay. <laughs> uh, so, so that was definitely part of my experience. Mm-hmm. But like almost everybody, I bought on a spot exchange, mm. right? And I think mm-hmm. that we can't underappreciate how important the spot exchanges like Coinbase are at being kind of that first uh, experience that most people have getting into crypto. Like I come from, like uh, I was working at BitMEX, right? Which is a derivatives exchange. You you know, for, for the longest time, you had to have Bitcoin before you could use BitMEX. So it was never the first port of call. It was always like after you had some experience already, right. you wanted to do some different stuff. Um, that was when you would end up there. But Coinbase is often the first place that people go to. And I'm wondering, like, how do you think of how do you think about that? Yeah. Yeah. Let's uh, get into the the meat of the discussion. Yeah. (laughs) So so maybe I'd say, like, let's start a little bit with, hey, why are crypto exchanges important? You know, which you alluded to. Um, And I would love to also maybe just for this audience, talk a bit about like crypto exchanges, like how they're they're actually built up and maybe how to even sort of think about them as a business model. Uh, and then certainly let's talk about like the user experience and why that's important. I, I'd say the, the first thing, the first reason why uh, spot exchanges are important, like you said, is usually the first interaction that like new users will have, you know, with the crypto economy. Mm-hmm. So, you know, what experts did in Singapore, uh, Coinbase in the US and beyond and other exchanges, like this is sort of what people remember, right? It's It's a consumer brand as much. Uh, as it is just sort of a, a piece of infrastructure. Mm. I think the second part is this, um, you know, crypto exchanges uh, are probably the most sort of dominant business model uh, in the industry right now. So there's many global crypto exchanges that have achieved scale um, in a way that maybe some other business models within crypto are still, you know, getting to. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the, that makes them somewhat like systematically important or systemically important as well. And I think the third part is more around the brand point of, uh, they're also flag bearers for the industry. You know, to, to alluding earlier to points around policy, uh, you know, with Coinbase and others, like we, a lot of times we will just, you know, spend uh, a lot of time and resources on just fighting or advocating for policy for the entire industry because we want to make sure that these uh, things sort of land in the right spot um, so that the crypto economy can continue to grow. Mm-hmm. So I think that's partly why, you know, crypto exchanges are, are sort of important. Now, the, the second uh, part of this is I also want to just address it like the lexicon a little bit. Mm. That, so we, we, talk about it being a crypto exchange mm. but i think that's a very loose term and i think it's colloquial at this point sure um you know that the, there's many many different services that are going on within what i would just call crypto platforms and you know we can certainly take coinbase as an example and i think for for a user audience the easiest way to think about it is in terms of verbs uh so what does the user come to this platform to do mm-hmm. um so you start with just buy sell Right. And that's more of a kind of a fiat on ramp off ramp experience. So you have to have fiat in order to buy some crypto. Then there's trade, which is based on order books. And that's a whole different kind of, you know, conversation on markets and uh, liquidity and order books and and things like that. Uh, And then there's a verb around store. So once you buy the crypto, uh, these centralized, you know, platforms will store it for you. And that's actually custody. And custody in traditional markets as well, like it's just a giant like discipline unto itself. Sure. Um, and then finally, the last one is what I would call send receive. Mm-hmm. So that's crypto transmissions, uh, and that's you know that those are like analogous to payment s- settlement systems, e wallets, uh, remittance systems, uh, and those again have their own regulatory regimes and complexity and business models around them. So so a lot of these uh, exchanges they might have started out with like you know one place or the other. But over time, like all of these services are pretty intricately bundled. uh, And that's what allows like these some relatively seamless experiences uh, for these users to happen where they can, you know, buy crypto in seconds and then send it off platform to their own self-custodial platform uh, without having to wait. Um, So I just wanted to provide a little bit of that impression of, you know, how to maybe think about, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what what are crypto platforms? Mm -hmm. uh, And then we can get into the user experience as well. But Sharon, I don't know if you wanted to. Yeah. Add on. Yeah. So maybe I'll talk more from a consumer point of view first before I go back to maybe my actual customers who are definitely more businesses. So for consumers, I think end of the day, it's um, the preferred. I think for someone who dares to come into the market today, they're probably 
I find a lot more authentically curious about what's crypto, you know, um, they know it perhaps might one day, you know, make them a bit richer than today, um, but they are still a little bit more interested in knowing what they're buying. So I think the today consumer in crypto, a lot of emphasis around clear explanation of what they're buying, you know, maybe you have a couple of links that if you don't really want to talk about Bitcoin in the purchase page itself, you know, a quick link to what is Bitcoin should be, in my opinion, readily made available to them. Because mm. um, I do think that the buyer persona now, you know, they, they are someone who wants to know what they want to get into and they're probably willing to l spend a bit more hours on that mm. yeah, than prior to before. Partly also because markets now are a bit calmer. So I think purchasers or potential prospects they have a bit more time now to read up you know before they buy more tokens even so let's say if they first start off with just the most popular bitcoin token um, but i think the propensity to click around and learn what are the other tokens available on screen um, is definitely a lot higher than before mm -hmm. uh, but they do want to know what they're buying so i think that's more of that the experience as educational, uh, even though I know you're doing this for educational reasons, uh, it's authentic. I really do think that in general, consumers do want that more. Yeah. yeah. Mm. For businesses, however... I do too. <laughs> I mean, others will be doing this. Yeah. yeah so um, for the business side, however, I do think that um, it's even more personal, ironically. Mm. Uh, they do need to have a very high trust in the team who is producing that tool or that support, you know, that's somehow working or, you know, they are professional enough to help my business, for example. Mm -hmm. So I do think that, you know, not just what you are producing, but the who are you uh, comes in a lot more actually in the B2B world now. Yeah, mm. especially I think given what's happened the past one year, the, the team and trust in the team and professional experience is very high right now. Okay. Yeah. Getting to the consumer uh, user experience. Um, so the way I, I think about the ideal user experience or what I would like them to feel, I would break it down into two parts. One, what I would call getting through the front door, mm -hmm. uh, onboarding. And then the second is the core experience of the product itself. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if you just go to coinbase.com or maybe if you uh, download the Coinbase app in Singapore, um, when you're doing uh, onboarding, you create, uh, you know, use your um, email address and, and phone number and you verify yourself. Um, now, one of the one of the things uh, about onboarding uh, that's sort of less appreciated is on the, the back end side, what you're trying to do is you're trying to solve for this uh, two by two, which is around false positives, false negatives, true positives, mm -hmm. true negatives. You want to give the best experience to your good users and you want to keep the bad actors out mm -hmm. and you want to minimize the friction that like good users have, but you also want to uh, have appropriate frictions or guardrails in place so that things like account takeovers don't happen because these are, you know, you're dealing with financial Absolutely, assets. Absolutely, yeah. So when we're going through all of these, you know, where we're, we've built up a lot of sort of uh, what uh, is colloquially called like a risk engine. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is for all, you know, fintechs and, and banks and whatnot. You ingest a lot of risk signals um, and then you, you know, come up with alerts or, um, you know, indicators that, that, hey, maybe I should ask this user more questions. Mm. But for a good user, the, the ideal frictionless experience in Singapore is uh, they, they log on, they put in their email address and, and phone number and they verify both of them. Uh, then they're served with SyncPass. It's a two-click experience. They switch over to their SyncPass uh, mobile app. They do Face ID, switch back into the Coinbase app. Uh, and that's basically it. They're that's fully it, huh? KYC. Yeah, and that's unique. We should mention that mm. this is something <laughs> yeah. you probably can't do in a lot of other places. Mm. Yes. So in Singapore, mm -hmm. uh, every resident uh, yeah. has basically a, a digital government ID that can be used for a variety of of, of these types of like credentials, right? Absolutely. It's one of the, the benefits of what I would call Singapore Inc. Mm -hmm. You know, it's this high fidelity government sponsored uh, database, which has, you know, true and up to date, um, you know, information about, uh, you know, uh, citizens and, and users. And they're obviously consenting to kind of, you know, hand that, uh, that, that uh, information across. Mm -hmm. um, but it's fantastic. It, it works across government apps and, you know, fintech apps and, and all that fun stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh it's really it's it's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's incredible yeah. how, how so well it works. We talked through identity verification. Mm -hmm. I think the next step to then onboarding is actually being able to fund your account um, mm -hmm. so that you can get some fiat across. Uh, so then you can uh, avail some of these services on these platforms. Now, the ideal experience here uh, is that the platform should offer the payment methods that you're used to in your local jurisdiction or your local market. Mm -hmm. uh, especially in Southeast Asia, there's many, many different kinds of e-wallets and payment methods. Uh, so the best uh, localized crypto platforms have, uh, make those payment me methods available uh, to their users. 
in Singapore, we're fortunate to have uh, what's called real-time payments network, uh, which is called FAST, Fast and Secure Transfers. Thanks, Aaron. And uh, that allows users to push payments from their underlying bank account to their Coinbase account. Uh, but the great thing is that it's uh, real-time, near instantaneous, uh, and it's free, and it's high limits to the tune of 200000 per transaction. So it works for both uh, consumers who want to do small tickets as well as ones that really want to transact in size. So that's sort of the onboarding journey, um, which again, in, in Singapore, you can get across uh, in less than two minutes uh, if, if everything is set up well for you. Actually, can I ask about that? Sure. So isn't, I thought the uh, limits for fast transfer is quite low, actually, mm. isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. The, this is the limit that is at the network level. Uh, above that, individual companies can choose to uh, throttle that. Uh, maybe they can also make it modular for you know new users or certain user segments versus having large limits by exception. So it really is a, a risk decision by the platform on top of fast. I think there are many like what Hassan shared. It's more risk controls on by many people. The network itself is two hundred grand per uh, transfer, not even per day, but per transfer. Okay, but there are. There are multiple players that come in to enforce their risk control. So one is definitely the platforms itself, you know, um, just in case, you know, someone had hacked into a customer's bank account and is trying to siphon out money, you know, platforms perhaps, you know, have different controls based on how new those accounts are as well. Second one, actually, back to the banks itself or the e-wallet holders themselves. So um, banks are also, unfortunately, you know, outside of crypto, the, the amount of fraudulent uh, hacks that have happened over the past few years is very high. Uh, so I think the banks themselves are trying to slowly, um, they are intentionally causing a little bit of friction in mm. terms of how much a consumer can make payments on fast network, regardless of whether it's crypto or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think usually it's some sort of setting that someone has to bypass uh, in their own bank account, mm -hmm. yeah, which is re nothing to do with the crypto platform, nothing to do with the fast network. It's just the bank account issue. Got it. Yeah. But from the network level, I can do $200,000 yeah, per, per transfer. transfer. So let's say if I'm a, I'm a, a wealthy uh, investor mm. and I want to put a million dollars on Coinbase, Today, because I I really have a strong conviction that uh, this is my favorite cryptocurrency is, mm. is going to go up. Mm. From the network's perspective, I can just do yeah. five transfers. Five times two hundred. Yeah. By right, okay. you can. Yeah. Got it. Okay. okay. I didn't understand that. Mm. All right. Yeah. So that's the the payment side of it, and and as Sharon said. Payments is a whole discipline in itself. We can spend more time on it uh, if we want. There's also mm -hmm. things around like card transactions um, as well. Cards uh, tend to provide broad coverage, but I think the best payments experiences are highly localized. Mm. So once you're on the platform and your account is funded, that's when the fun begins. That's when you can actually start to you know, uh, uh, make use of all the products and services that are available. So starting out with maybe just the simple buy-sell uh, experience. And, and for crypto beginners, this is where we mostly see people you know, get started. Uh, you want to just get some exposure, get some skin in the game. Maybe you heard about a crypto asset from a friend and you just want to buy a little bit. We also encourage to, to yeah, start slowly as well. And, and if you're not familiar yet, uh, do just start small uh, and then maybe monitor your position or, or something for a week. Uh, I think it's super important to get educated. Uh, we also have learning resources on the Coinbase platform itself that you can just access in app. We'll provide kind of in context explanations of what the asset is about uh, as well. So, so I think th that's sort of the next uh, leg of the user journey. And where it starts getting to me of where you make the jump from a, a crypto novice to really starting getting a proficiency is once you're able to send crypto out from any centralized platform to your self-custodial wallet. So a self-custodial wallet is one where you control the private keys. Uh, and you can use that to connect to decentralized applications. Uh, and that's when you've officially entered the crypto economy, in my view. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Interesting to hear someone at a centralized <laughs> uh, platform <laughs> yeah, uh, make that sure. statement. Okay. Yeah. So I guess, you know, Coinbase is probably one of the most famous um, front door crypto brands in the world. Maybe the most, the most famous. Um, what do you guys think about in terms of the experience that you want to give people uh, who are, are, you know, just starting to get that interest in, in wanting to buy some crypto, wanting to enter the ecosystem, 
Um, you know, what responsibilities do you feel that you guys have? And then what um, just sort of general user experience do you try to, to try to create? Yeah, so we were very passionate about making sure that crypto is uh, accessible uh, to everyone. And uh, what a lot of our brand promise is about is being the most trusted and easiest to use crypto platform in the world. Uh, on the trust side of things, we haven't spoken much about it yet, but I think this is a, a seminal and a very central topic about crypto exchanges and how maybe even new users should uh, make the decision of you know what platform they want to engage with. Uh, I think trust sort of comes down to a few different factors. Uh, one is just uh, more formally like, hey, is this exchange uh, licensed uh, or you know has locally uh, present in my jurisdiction? Um, Thing that uh, that provides some additional protections because if your local regulator is is sort of somewhat respectable uh, and there's a local crypto licensing there's certain rules that everyone has to follow uh, that provides additional uh, protections and safeguards now this isn't like a foolproof uh, thing but it does um, you know speak to hey this uh, this company has sort of taken the time and energy and resources to be compliant with uh, local laws and regulations and that's something that coinbase always tries to do I think on top of it, um, you know, having a very strong kind of risk controls program uh, is extremely, extremely important as well. Uh, for us, part of our journey uh, here is, you know, along with just this being in our DNA, is that as we were going through a public listing process, there was just a lot of high standards that we had to meet. Uh, things like, you know, being audited by a big four accounting firm as part of your your process of being in public um, just requires, you know, that sort of next level of of uh, being uh, enterprise grade ready. Uh, so to speak. And I think the third is really just about like the culture within that company um, that sort of comes across in their public relations and, uh, you know, the things that they these uh, companies focus on, what they talk about. Uh, if it's just a lot about, um, you know, somewhat of promoting speculation or, or just talking about like, hey, we have these sort of tokens and, you know, you can earn like these kinds of multiples on it. Those companies are probably going to be in trouble at some point mm. um, as well. Then there's other invisible factors like, hey, is this crypto platform actually trading against you. Uh, those things are harder to kind of pick up on, uh, but there are actually regulations around this concept of market integrity mm -hmm. uh, that are actually coming across online across the world, uh, which will have to address some of these concerns. So I think being kind of trusted and compliant is a really big deal and somewhat invisible, like once you're actually onboarded, but that's part of the diligence that like, a consumer and individual should be doing for themselves. Mm. I think beyond that, um, you know, accessibility and ease of use is something that we we really focus on a lot as well. Uh, a lot of our uh, platform is actually geared towards just uh, you know folks who are starting out in crypto. Mm -hmm. um, so what we uh, actually call it, uh, our product is sort of simple buy and sell mm -hmm. because uh, that's what's akin to like a brokerage experience. So if you go to like a Charles Schwab or something uh, and you 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 know want to get a quote, that quote is just one number and it's sort of you know honored for like a certain amount of time. Um, and that allows that user to basically just, you know, buy that asset um, as opposed to when you're an order book and, you know, you've got like numbers and, and just prices going up and down and you have more advanced order types. Those are also important. But, you know, in the traditional world, like you don't see individuals going to Nasdaq directly and, and they're not even uh, allowed to. Uh, but within crypto exchanges, uh, most crypto exchanges will have both simple and advanced modes. Uh, and we do as well. Hmm. And okay, I didn't realize you guys had it. What do you What do you guys have on the in the advanced mode side? So that's uh, if uh, for folks who have been in the industry, that's what used to be Coinbase Pro. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Coinbase does have its own uh, liquidity, its own trading venue, its own uh, exchange engine, effectively mm -hmm. uh, to support you know multiple order books. So all of the assets that are listed on our platform, we have order books against them. Okay. So even in Singapore, uh, when you go to our platform, you can actually switch from simple to advanced mode. Uh, and that will uh, that will be then made available uh, to you. Got it. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. And do I have to have any kind of accreditation or or anything to be able to use advanced mode or uh, for spot order books? No, okay. that's generally available. Okay. Very cool. Something to think about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sharon. Uh, so you guys, um, you're in the business of not onboarding um, crypto end users, individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you're onboarding businesses yeah. to be able to use crypto. Mm. What do you think of, what is the experience that you want these businesses to have? Yeah, I think maybe taking a step back before answering the 
businesses part of it as well. I think what's happening in crypto industry, um, just think of if they're not consumers, there's the whole range of DAOs and projects and protocols and then there's companies as well. Um, so I think they all, you know, what how they operate, they have different demands based on how the maybe I would say governance structure of the project is. Um, so I can probably speak more for companies of the nature. So if you know if a project markets themselves as a DAO, but the underlying is more of a company or a actual registered foundation that has very high internal stakeholder management, to me it's almost akin to like a company. Mm. Uh, so those, you know, I can kind of at least speak on behalf. Yeah. So for those, um, I think given all the the more more and more detailed policy and regulation requirements coming out, um, specifically when it comes to um, your FinOps, your financial operations. I think even in Singapore, I think the recent past months, uh, there have been a lot of uh, you know industry and our regulators at MAS. You know, there's been a lot of exchanges coming up around what's the ideal FinOps structure behind the scenes, mm. whether it's segregation of wallets to what extent, uh, as well as to what extent of you know reporting or reconciliation in a in a lighter sense as well. Um, you know, very clear guidelines are coming up now. So I think if you're a company or a entity license the onshore entity that's being that's op operating and handling crypto assets on your books um, there's a lot of rush I would say to improve your FinOps to be um, I would say aligned with these guidelines yeah so there, there has been a foray of tools that has made a return so I think you know what I personally observe is way back in 2017 18 you know, there was a wave of I would say uh, crypto tech solutions you know Largely, however, targeted at consumers back then. Now, um, the wave that I was even I'm part of is tools that can help businesses better track and bookkeep their you know digital assets. What was really going on? E solutions like EtherScan might show you that the transfer has really been settled on chain, but it's more of just a payment confirmation. It doesn't mm -hmm. really. It's not something that you can straight away give to a reporter or even internal management that, hey, this is the state of my financial health. It's just one spot payment transaction, right? Mm. Um, so there's tools now to, you know, reconcile all your assets, your balance, your ins, your outs, almost like a cash flow statement, but in the form of digital assets. Mm. Um, and also maybe even combining digital assets with the realities of fiat. Because mm. I think a lot of teams in crypto or businesses in crypto do deal with a lot of fiat as well. The conversion evolve, between yeah. yeah. So the conversion between crypto and fiat um is also quite messy and frequent. Mm -hmm. Uh so you know for us at least that's the reason why I kind of jump on board to be that one reconciliation tool around all these digital asset transactions and stuff like that. Largely because it's just too much transactions to for a business um, to handle. But yet, you know, I think regulations are definitely keeping up that this is the expected behavior of any company in crypto, or at mm. least dealing with crypto assets. Even how do companies report mm. uh, crypto assets? Yeah, I currently? think in terms of that, they are. Number one, I think goes back to where is where are they obliged to report their financials? Mm -hmm. uh, it also depends. Um, there are various. I think first off, it's internal management reporting first. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised. I think a lot of um, teams they don't really know like a nice snapshot of their balance, receivables, payables. Um, they just whereas you know we do it even more diligently sometimes on our personal portfolio trackers, mm. but we don't do it cumulatively on the company wallet's perspective. So I think minimally just knowing that balance ins and outs is the first step. But when it goes back to financial actual reporting to regulators or auditors, they all come with different requirements already. Mm. So whether it's for tax reasons, tax is also very different, whether it's income tax, GST is very different. Mm. Um, auditors probably are looking at more like the sanctity of the business, not so much for tax reasons. Mm -hmm. So that's where granularity might be expected. So do you can you really trace back every single transaction if you're asked about it? Mm -hmm. So yeah. So I think unfortunately I think reporting standards has not yet been standardized in that sense. Yeah. Very cool. Guys, thank you so much for being here, uh both of you. Now, I'd like to ask your thoughts mm -hmm. on uh some of the things that's been going on recently in, in, in the current events of crypto. Uh, one of the biggest ones that everyone is talking about, of course, is, is WorldCoin, mm. uh, which is Sam Altman of OpenAI's uh, crypto project. Uh, Hassan, what do, you, what do you think about WorldCoin? <laughs> so I'm not as uh, skeptical 
of it. Uh, I was initially, and then I listened to the the whole Bankless episode uh, with yeah. the founders. That was illuminating in terms of at least how they thought about it and how it's constructed. I'm still not fully convinced, but uh, it, it brought me along a long way. I think that the the problem statement is is valid. Uh, you know, being civil resistant, uh, providing kind of proof of personhood in a scalable way. I think that those that's a pretty important horizontal problem to solve across, um, and not it doesn't have just crypto implica- implications, uh, but can be used in many many different ways. I think where a lot of people get hung up on is the the whole um, iris scanning, right? And and mm. then the orb just I think has a certain connotation around it. Yeah, mm. it's that's, creepy. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. It, <laughs> and so let's see how that plays out. Maybe it destigmatizes, maybe it normalizes, or maybe they they change course. But I, I think what I respected was uh, they said, look, we explored a whole bunch of different ways of, of running biometrics. And this seemed to be the the one that was most unique uh, as well as looked potentially more scalable. Mm. Um, now, it doesn't, I think, fully account, take into account the human uh, and emotional aspect of it. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I understand more where they're coming from. Mm-hmm. Why did they discuss? I ha- I have this episode queued in my in my <laughs> place. I haven't listened. To it. Did they discuss why not just go with a simple thumbprint? Like, I I think it has to do with just the unique identifiers and how uh, quickly and with high fidelity uh, the the any any hardware would be able to pick it up for okay. the the problem that they're trying to solve. They were able to. The, uh, you can get more uniqueness from the iris scan of it than, than the right. thumb. I guess. Right. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Do yeah, I mean as well. I've not read it. <laughs> I've not listened to it in detail. Um, I was asked actually to whether you know I would like to go down to scan my iris. I think in Singapore there's two ops going around recently. Oh really? Um, I did catch myself like no, I can wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I was a bit disappointed in myself. I was like, huh? Where's Where's the old adventurous man? I was like, you know, this is my identity. I should definitely read up about how um. I think who owns the data and stuff like that. I think I'd read a couple of technical, uh, not papers, but tweets around yeah. it about how it's just a proxy that's on chains. Um, but I think the reason why I just haven't taken the leap is because I myself am not yet educated about the ownership and you know the sharing rights that they have and yeah. stuff like that, or the hardware as well. Um, even though I understand that that proxy is on chain and I think it's encrypted and stuff with ZK, but I wasn't even right now today. I I can't give you clarity around the hardware of it like is it yeah. really that where is it shared right because it, it is capturing data somehow yeah so i find it interesting however that why is there no quick infographic simple infogra- infographic around simple questions like this yeah yeah it's every tweet storm is highly technical one yeah. thing i remember is uh when they started uh delivering covid vaccines mm. there was a lot of skepticism from among people I knew mm. about well how did they develop these vaccines so quickly like I'm not taking it no way and then from people who are not you know kind of like your typical like anti-vaxxer like mm. educated people that I knew like expressed a lot of, a lot of skepticism and and I don't want to be I don't want to be the first one to take this right and then as soon as they started making it like well you can't travel unless you take it. Everyone's like, all right, all right, all right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm in, you know? And, and I guess what makes me, why I think about that is because if the utility of the, of WorldCoin, I guess, becomes undeniable, I'm guessing a lot of people mm. are probably going to just go ahead and go, ah, you know, it's just my iris. Yeah. <laughs> right? What are they going to do with my, my yeah. iris? I think going back to how, you know, you're we raving about SingPass, right? Um, yeah. It is... It is giving, you know, I mean, we all know that, however, I think the difference here is that we know that, this, at least for as a Singaporean speaking, we know that from the day we were born, the yeah. government has our identity already. Sure. Um, this is just a different technology such that it's safer for a third-party application to capture and know that I am a, you know, legal c- Singapore citizen. So I think it's not so freaky in that sense, but it all stems from the willingness to accept the fact that you know, who owns my data and I'm okay with that. Mm. I think WorldCoin, however, is a bit different because it's, it's still more of a wild experiment. We don't really know, you know, I think the premise is more for others to consume that data in that safe way. Mm-hmm. Um, one might say maybe before, you know, in safer integrations like SingPass came about for centralized exchanges, we were always taking photos, you know, liveliness tests. Who knows what people do with our photos? You know, they can doctor it and do something else. That's true. But back to your question, we wanted to buy and sell crypto. So that's why we 
just went ahead to do it. Yeah. Um, but the tech security back then was perhaps questionable. Yeah, so we shall see, I think. Uh, yeah. I'm also asking myself why I'm not willing to get my eyes scanned. Yeah, I don't know if I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if 25 I, more <laughs> coins a day may, may not be enough. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it feels like a one-way decision. You yeah. know, once it's in there, it's in there. Mm-hmm. I think a good thought mm-hmm. experiment is so this is their first party product. Mm. What if they changed, uh, go to market and went via distributions with yeah. uh, governments and yeah. Apple, for example, right? Because we do Face ID every day. Mm. My bet would be people mm. wouldn't think twice. Yeah. And they'd just be like, sure, this yeah. is part of my natural workflow. Yeah. And I already trust this entity. Mm. So I mean, whenever we go we travel, way to think about it. Yeah. they just look at it. It's also the iris scan actually that's happening. So it's already happening at airports. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I believe that. And that's a really good point about about Apple. We do face scan every day, mm. right? So what's the difference, right? Yeah. It should mm. be okay. <laughs> yeah, except we don't know these guys, right? Didn't they just show up? Right? Yeah. I we just started Sam using ChatGPT a few months ago. <laughs> I don't know him. Yeah, we don't know uh, him you know, personally. Come on. His name just, has been everywhere. Yeah. But for like for like three months, yeah. right? Yeah. Come on. We don't know these guys. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Give it some time. I think that the good thing is it's forcing the conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think it's it's a, it's an attempt, right? They, they put something out there. People can react to it. And I think even their party line is if you don't trust us, you don't have to do it. Yeah. <laughs> to me, it's, it's an example of off-chain data to on-chain and rewards and stuff. I don't know why Stepan came out in my mind. I'm wondering <laughs> what, what's the next generation of like crazy consumer engagement that brings them, you know, the new wave, right, into crypto. Because like, you know, not, I think, you know, the whole play to earn wave brought in a lot of new consumers yeah so worldcoin is facing resistance there uh, i know it's a pure blockchain <laughs> application use case nothing to do with financial application at all so, but it's not reacting i think people are not reacting well to it it's only the mm. crypto natives that dare to do it but you know the play to earn games it definitely did not bring in crypto natives actually it brought in mm. the non-crypto natives then the crypto natives jumped on right so i don't know what's the next yeah 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 i think that's that's super interesting right mm. to see to see how how that's going to work. Um, one other story that's been in the news recently that I wanted to get your thoughts on. Okay. Uh, so Twitter is now X, yeah. I guess. I'm so mm-hmm. confused by exactly how this works. So like, are we calling it X now? <laughs> or is it still, do we tweet on X? Or is X just like the uh, overbrand of we still call it Twitter. Is it still well, called Twitter, the, but the icon is X, not yeah, the bird? They, they've yeah. changed the icon. And yeah, they're think calling they it Zeets it. now. So No. <laughs> that's is that in, true? That's in their FAQs. How do I Zeet? So oh. I don't think that I'll be you're using it. Jo- you're, you're not no, joking. No, it's in, yeah, it's, in it's called Zeet. Yeah, X-E-E-T. Interesting. Oh, but the app is called X. I believe so. Yeah. I haven't done wow. my, my new, my recent upgrade. I saw a logo recently with the X, mm. and there was a D right next to it, which at first got me excited. Okay. I said, "Elon, if you want, <laughs> if you want to talk, I'm right here, man. Just come talk to me." Uh, and then someone pointed out that the D had the little dash through it, which is the symbol for Dogecoin. Oh, okay. Now we know Elon Musk is a big Dogecoin yeah. fan. Okay. And he's been talking about uh, his plan for Twitter has mm. has often has been about creating a, a super app. Mm. Kind of like uh, uh, Sina Weibo uh, for uh, you know is, uh, the role that that has in China. Mm. He wants Twitter to serve for the West and possibly using Doge as payment rails behind this. Are you guys up on any of this or what do you? Yeah, I think X. I think the vision. It all stems from I think Elon's. I say as his first name as though he's my friend, <laughs> Elon Musk. Um, he did have some payments exposure, right? The whole PayPal stuff. So I guess he, he really always wanted to bring in or get into the payments game somehow again. Uh, so now this is Arena. And I do think there's a lot of merits in super app concepts. Like WeChat has WeChat Pay, Grab has now Grab Pay. You know, it's, it's fantastic that e-wallets in such um, non-financial apps initially. Doge as a, as a mode of payment, I'm on the fence. Yeah. Um, I can see how it's a intermediary um, transfer of value, perhaps. Kind of a little bit like, I guess, what Ripple is in the whole Ripple network a little bit. Um, but at least my personal take is Doge and um, very obvious or explicitly needed intermediary, mm. questionable. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, he, he can always... What would be interesting if he doesn't just... Um, allow Doge only by just crypto in general yeah. uh, that would perhaps be a lot more fairer yeah yeah interesting yeah one of the the aspects of the changes that I caught my eye that I thought was super interesting is um, 
I, I don't know if you guys have been seeing this in your timeline of uh, mm. folks with large followers starting to get checks back from X mm. uh, in terms of uh, creator monetization or no, audience kind of monetization. Yeah. yeah. So I think it started a few months back when when I, Elon announced that hey, if there are ads in the replies to your your mm. threads and comments, uh, you will um, you will earn a cut off of that as well in terms of how many eyeballs um, you know look at that ad. So I think people kind of poop out that or, or said, hey, you know, it just feels like an empty promise. Mm. But then recently in the last few weeks, a lot of folks, again, these could be doctored screenshots or might, might be even a meme, but they've come back with like these really kind of healthy um, sort of uh, stripe disbursements that have been like coming mm. to their bank accounts. Mm. So I think that I think the cool underlying thing that if it is indeed heading in this direction is more, you know, towards uh, what we in kind of crypto talk about is this community uh, of user owners. Mm. So how do you kind of give monetization and, and power back to the creators who are the ones who are bringing value to your platform in the first place? Mm -hmm. So definitely, I think blockchain and crypto has a role to play in sort of activating that and making that more frictionless. Mm. But um, if this is indeed one of the directions that that Elon wants to to go towards, um, and I think that's also why he had the whole subscriber thing mm -hmm. so uh, specifically enforced, uh, the $8 a month plan thing. Mm -hmm. um, that could change the face of you know what Twitter looks and feels like. So take out the bots, take out the inflated numbers, mm. and then just focus on on true value and then share that value back. Yeah, which is of course always uh, I think exciting development to see uh, the web take is sharing you know sharing ownership and value yeah. among users. Yeah, I think the the crypto native examples of this are probably Farcaster and Lens mm -hmm. uh, on yeah. the decentralized social media side. Uh, I'm very excited about those use cases. Uh, I can see the traction there and the excitement. Yeah. Uh, and historically, what we've seen is, you know, when there's developer mm -hmm. energy, a little bit of funding, and you know, users just generally playing around with it, mm -hmm. um, it tends to, you know, evolve and emerge into good things. This is how like NFTs came about as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I I'm excited about that space as well. I feel like um, a lot of the products that we see are still not quite. Uh, comparable to the centralized products, mm -hmm. uh, I think they would need to get a lot more uh, user friendly before we see mass adoption. But uh, I, in, as a principle, I think um, the the economic model is is unbeatable. I think I, I I don't see why anybody would use a lot of centralized a lot of the centralized digital products that we use today. I think are going to have a very hard time to compete in in a world where decentralized products are uh, com comparably user friendly. Um, that's my prediction for a lot of this stuff in the gaming space, learning space, um, and and you know potentially a lot of other spaces as well. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for being here with me, Hassan and Sharon. Uh, for those of you listening to this or watching this at home. Uh, again, my name is Lawrence from XD Academy, and I'm very excited to announce that the XD Academy website is now live. Come visit us at xd.academy. That's just xd.academy, and you can uh, register and join for absolutely free. We have an incredible course up right now about the economics of Bitcoin taught by Dr. Saifuddin Amas, author of the Bitcoin Standard. He is one of the most uh, famous proponents of, of Bitcoin. He has an incredibly uh, unique perspective on this subject and I think is really someone that is worth listening to. And it's a great course. I hope you like it. And of course, if you want to engage with the rest of the XD community, please join us on our Discord at dsc.gg slash XD Academy. I'm in there. The rest of the team is in there. and We look forward to meeting you as well. Thanks so much.